Um, we'll turn the time over to Kathy and uh, Colonel Vargas. Thanks. Are we, are we on? Can you hear us okay? Is, okay. This, is this? Oh, it is oh, on. You're on now. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Since, since you have already seen Colonel Vargas's uh, video, so you have a general idea of what his Medal of Honor action is today, then we're going to kind of let him tell us what he wants us to hear in terms of what he's doing. We'll probably get to that at the end, but we'll go with a lot of questions that you have from the perspective of teachers who are going to go back and be presenting the character program to the um, students in your classrooms. So we kind of try to direct the, the discussion in that general way as opposed to any details about, about the war unless you want to present them as you, as you see Whatever. fit. So do you want to start with a few words? Or? Well, I, I just want to thank all of you for being here, number one. And number two, having taught myself many, many years ago, uh, I want to thank you for what you're doing today and, and ensuring that uh, America's children and are, are going to have a great future because you are, in my eyes, the most important people in, in uh, my personal opinions. Uh, you're, you're creating the future of America, and boy, do we really need it today. <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you for what you do. It's a great profession. I loved it. I loved teaching. Uh, it's just that I got tired of the administration crap that came with the jobs. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is, you know. And, and uh, you know, and I, I can remember I was coaching a junior high uh, basketball team, and the principal came up to me and says, "You got to take tickets." Well, the game is about ready to start, and I'm supposed to go take tickets. I told him goodbye, you know. <laughs> so I went with the LA Dodgers for a little while in the minor leagues, and, and uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, couldn't hit the slider, but I laughed today because nobody else can hit it either. <laughs> so, but uh, Buzzy Bavese was the guy. Uh, he was the owner. He's the one that picked me up at a, at a college level, spotted me. But the, the thing that uh, where he really came down and it was when I was playing for the Marine Corps, uh, a baseball team, and, and uh, we, of course, we were spoiled. We had some of the greatest ball players in the Corps that they'd either played professional or had played in the Pan American games and so forth. And we came together and traveled to the United States because uh, they did away with football in the Marine Corps because nobody wanted to play the Marines anymore because <laughs> the Marines never lost. You know, they, they played a different kind of football in those days. They would bite and rip off ears and things like that. <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, our baseball team was a lot of fun. And, and those of you that have children, uh, get them involved in some kind of sports. I kind of miss seeing uh, a lot of our children today not even doing anything physically. Uh, and it, uh, you have to. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just the way we, America is. You just can't let these young guys walking across the street not paying any attention to traffic lights on this doggone by the way, I don't know where the hell my phone is, do you? <laughs> but it, the thing is, is that uh, uh, what you're doing today is priceless in my eyes, and, and, and I envy you. Uh, but it's really funny. After I got into the Corps, I probably did more teaching in the Marine Corps than I would have probably done, uh, as Frank knows, uh, from, uh, from my area down in San Diego area, is that uh, you, you get, in, you get in the military, it's a hell of a profession also. And I ended up teaching at the University of New Mexico you know, for three years. You know, they sent me off to get the advanced degrees. They paid for it, but then I had to pay back. And uh, boy, I was cocky. You know, I was going to be a college professor. Wow. And it turned out that uh, I had the NROTC unit at the University of New Mexico as the XO. And my classes were at the 300 level, which meant what? Anyone who was a major in history smarter than Jay Vargas could have taken my class. You know, I thought I was just going to deal with midshipmen and, and uh, MESEP, NESEPs uh, enlisted from the Marine Corps and the Navy. No <laughs> wrong. You know, and I had a lot of spring butts, you know. And finally I would say, hey, look, you want to teach the damn class? Get your butt down. <laughs> you know. But they shut up after a while. 
And I knew why they were at my class. They were just wanted that three-hour credit and thought it was going to be thought it was going to be easy, and I made damn sure that uh, a lot of them left after a week because I let them know what I was expecting of them, like you do with your students. And, uh, you know, it's psychological, scare the hell out of them, and they leave. <laughs> but uh, with that, I guess uh, that was the main thing I wanted to tell you, is that uh, don't ever quit. So the Medal of Honor program that you're learning about today, the CDP, is what the uh, Medal of Honor recipients refer to as their legacy program. And uh, Colonel Vargas has been a wonderful advocate for that program, doing events like this, visiting schools, um, sticking up for us within the organizations, <laughs> and uh, just always backing us up on that. And with his history and education, you can see that, but uh, before you became either a teacher or uh, the, the Marine that you became, Mm. You had you grew up in a small in small town America, and these are people who are out here who are dealing with our little kids right now. And would you <laughs> give us a little bit of what what prepared what you? I went through. What prepared you to be in the Marine Corps? I mean, <laughs> three older brothers—that's pretty good preparation, right there. <laughs> but um, what what was your life like? And uh, from what, a puppy. From a puppy, and yeah. what what were your um, guiding values? Well, I think that mine came from, of course, my mother. She was from Italy, and her dad from Spain, but so I'm a mixture of half uh, tamales and chili and half spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they're the ones that really gave, uh, gave me the, uh, the rules of the road for life. But uh, growing up in uh, this huge city that I grew up in, uh, it was called Winslow, Arizona, about uh, 7,000 people at the time, you know, it was, uh, everyone knew each other, but uh, it, it was, to me, it was kind of tough because uh, it was, you know, the war was on. My two brothers were in the Pacific. One was in Iwo Jima battle, and the other one was in the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, but I, you know, I was home going over maps, and I was stealing my, mots, my mother's spaghetti pots, you know, and putting the Marine Corps on the Montanair and wearing, <laughs> and I was always cutting the, the, her brooms so I could have a barrel on my make believe rifle and of course I used to get my butt chewed out all the time but the thing about that town it was kind of a prejudice atmosphere even among even though my mother had two sons in the Pacific you know her being from Italy uh, there were several people uh, that used to say oh you're one of Mussolini's gals you know and of course uh, after she decked one of these ladies <laughs> <laughs> that stopped <laughs> And, uh, and then in my dad's side of the house, because, you know, Vargas is a Hispanic name, and, and uh, I wasn't allowed to go to the swimming pool with the, all the guys that I grew up with, you know, and played ball with. Uh, it was strictly a white man's swimming pool. And, and uh, well, Willie Reeves, like, you want me to tell the story? Yeah, tell, tell the Willie Reeves was uh, a black. Uh, he worked for the Santa Fe Railroad, but it's, uh, he was sort of like, uh, he got laid off, you know, there's seniority, so he needed a job. So my mom hired him as a, sort of a nanny, because she started country western stores, and dad was in the newspaper business, and they didn't, you know, they needed help. So he was my nanny. I went all over this town with, it was always <coughs> Willie and little J.R. And one day, I was sitting in the bleachers, and a lot of my guys that I played ball with were, were sitting, you know, we were about 14, 15, I guess. No, yeah. And I, uh, Willie says, you want to go swimming? And I said, uh, Willie, I don't think I'm allowed to go in there. And he says, well, neither am I. But I had the question, Jay, do you want to go swimming? <laughs> and I said, damn right I do. I bet you didn't say that. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I learned it from my mom. <laughs> so anyway, we zoomed the block, got my swimming suit on, came back to the bathhouse, walked in, Willie laid a dime down for Jay, into the bathhouse, Mrs. Petronovich was yelling, Willie, you can't go in there, you're, you're, you're you know, and Jay, he just got, you know, was, you know, you're not allowed to go in there. And, and Willie says, mm. we walk through the bathhouse, we go down to the end of the pool, and uh, the swimming pool is still there. 
And what's funny is Coach Nazar, which, which was one of my mentors in, in school, he was the lifeguard. His first year in, in, uh, as a football coach, of course, he's over there going, <laughs> blowing his whistle and saying, God, you know, Willie had me down about ready to go into the water. And Emil comes up, and that Coach Nazar says, hey, <laughs> hey, Willie, what the hell are you doing? You know, he can't go in there. And he says, well, he's half a tie, and you've got some other tie-ins in there. How about if he sticks his leg in the other, one of his legs in there and let him kick it around? In a week, the pool was open to everyone. <laughs> but I, I have to say that it wasn't really just Willie's experience with you that got the pool open, right? Oh, no. He got you in the pool that day, but how did, he, how did you end up with the pool open? Uh, my mother was a tough gal. <laughs> She went down to the city council and told Mayor Shipley and uh, the rest of the gang, you know, she had something on every damn one of them. <laughs> and she says, uh, you're making me mad. <laughs> and she unloaded on it. And uh, boy, I tell you, that uh, not only was a pool open, I tell you, anything else that was locked, you know, whites only, that, those signs disappeared in a matter of uh, days. But uh, it's funny how uh, today, I, we joke about it, but uh, it was kind of painful. And occasionally when I travel the nation, I visit the schools and I run into the students that are, you know, having a tough go. <laughs> so I end up telling this little story. They kind of look at me like, Jesus, I haven't had it that bad, you know? Uh, you know, these are some of the young, young boys. They're about ready to quit school. And I said, no, 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 you're not going to quit school. He says, I can't do this math stuff, you know. I said, don't sweat it. Just hang in there, do the best you can, and, and ask for the, the, the regular math, you know, if you can't, you know. And this is what bothers me about the curriculums that you all have to go through. You know, I have met th hundreds of teachers. And you know what they tell me, Jay? All I want to do is teach. I just want to teach, and I'm so locked into some curriculum from the federal government, the city, the council, the, the Cal California as an example, and, and it, they don't have much flexibility. And when this program, when we decided that we needed a vehicle, some of us that had traveled through many of your schools, realized that students weren't having any fun anymore, and they needed something like this. This thing, this creature we call the character development program is probably the, the, the most precious jewel we could, uh, we, the 72 of us, are leaving behind as our legacy. Because the students are going, they love this course. They love it. Teachers tell me, you know, Bobby Joe sitting in the back room hadn't said one damn word in a year. And now when he gets into the citizenship or patriotism or whatever it is, you can't shut the damn guy up. <laughs> so it's, it's something different, and that's the beauty of this course. And uh, uh, that's why it's uh, so, it's being, oh God, what do we have, several states involved already. We're, we're in 40 states plus DC, and we're trying to get into the last few. Jason's gonna take it into Utah for us in a couple of weeks good, here. Good, good. So we're, uh, we're working on the last 10. There's a reason we aren't in those last 10. It's kind of hard to get a group together, um, but we're working on it. And you know, one of the things that, that uh, Colonel Vargas just mentioned as far as um, making this flexible for all of you to use in the classroom, that's, that's really been crucial for us, and it's also been part of the Citizen Honors, which you just practiced, just learned about, because I think it's very easy for um, our students to see people who are wearing this medal uh, and think, They're, I'll never be like them, I can't be like them. But before they were awarded this medal, they were like all the rest of us, and most of us never get tested to the point where we have to look deep inside and find out whether or not we have that, what it takes to do what needed to be done at the time. I wasn't here this morning for the history of the Medal of Honor, but Courtney knows that she, they try not to give me the microphone because I talk too much on that one. Um, <laughs> but I've had the good fortune since Jason gave away my secret of growing up with the Medal of Honor. For me, it was normal because the house they brought me home to when I was born 
had the Medal of Honor on the wall. And I've had to remind myself that that's not normal for most people and that not everybody grows up with a role model like that. So this opportunity to have you here talking to these mm, teachers. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Cost um, you $2. I, the price keeps going up. When we started this, it was a quarter. Um, it's a so, union. <laughs> you guys have a union? No wonder you're so difficult. Jeez. Um, so I, I'd like to turn this over, though. I, I could ask questions all day, and we could have a conversation all day. Uh, that's, a, you know, for me, a special privilege, but I want to share that privilege with you. So what questions would you like to ask Colonel Vargas? Gosh, you know, anything. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear that okay? Mm -hmm. the, so when, when you were 13 or 14, do you think you ever could have visualized yourself being where you are today? Not really. I was too interested in girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Distract them with each other. <laughs> See, well, I'm honest. You guys can't deny it either. <laughs> no, it, uh, uh, no, not really. I, I was big into, you know, I, I, you saw in the film there, uh, my dad was grooming me for baseball, whether I liked it or not. And he would, he would, you know, tennis balls, tennis professional teachers had big baskets. My dad had a big baskets. But all he did is just kept throwing grounders and kept throwing a ball. And he tried to get me, teaching me how to glove the ball. And this went on for at least an hour every, every night when I came home from school. And then he would, take me out and give me a broomstick and I would uh, hit rocks, you know, in a Mr. Salazar's backyard and boy was he always mad at me, but, <laughs> but uh, and you know, hitting rocks with a, with a broomstick is not that easy. And what he was doing, I didn't realize, he was developing my eye contact on a, on a ball and a, and a bat. But uh, no, I did not. I, I, um, I knew I was going to play sports. You know, but uh, look at me, I'm not a big guy, I even played football. Can you imagine, I was 129 pounds. You know, who the hell was I gonna scare? But, uh, <laughs> but I liked, I was a quarterback. But uh, baseball was my thing, I just loved it. You know, I, eat, I still do, you know. It, uh, and I know Courtney's crazy about the LA Dodgers <laughs> as, as I am, and I'm so concerned that they don't choke, you know, <laughs> again. <laughs> because so, this, is the, this is our year. You know, yeah. I hope so. So to, to that end, though, to go back to the question of getting those kids from being self-centered and looking beyond themselves, you know, you had a, a rather tough transition because you were headed into professional baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you want to tell us how you coped with that and maybe tell us the story of how you got into the Marine Corps as a result? You know, this, it, it, as you know, we've all gone up different Pass and, and, and many of us have slipped and failed a little bit, but you know, you've all picked yourself back up and, and so forth. I, I went forward thinking, you know, God, I, I think I can do this. I think I can break the bubble and, and make it to the big show. Well, it didn't happen. And you heard me say earlier that for some reason the slider was deadly to me. I could hit anything but the slider. And as I, I was honest, you know, I've learned now that when I watch ball games that uh, nobody else can hit the damn thing either. <laughs> so maybe I should have stuck it out. But I got, uh, there was a girl involved in all that jazz. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home and uh, totally devastated. But I had a great old man that just said, hey, how many guys make it that far? Think about it. So, you know, my mother knew something was in the wind. You know how these Italian women are, you know, it's every morning, go to Mass, Jay, we gotta go to Mass, we gotta, oh, I got so tired of going to the Mass and praying for my two brothers in the Pacific, but I did, every morning. But she got, when it was, is, is it, I was at that stage after leaving the, the, the minor leagues, the pro ball stuff, she was afraid that I was gonna go into the Marine Corps because <clears throat> the other brothers, all three were, you know, World War II in Korea. And, uh, she says, what's the matter with you, you know, stupido? 
you go into the Navy, they sleep in white sheets, big pillows, you know, they smoke big cigars, and you know, they sometimes stand on a ship, and it's just a great life, and you, don't, please don't go to the Marine Corps. And I said, well, I, I was, you know, rumors were flying that Jay was thinking about going to the Corps. One Sunday morning, and I'm sure some of you parents had the same, every Sunday our clan had to come together. It was spaghetti and pasta and all that. That was a traditional thing. So I walked in and all three brothers, one came, two came from San Bernardino and one came from uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona for the Sunday deal. And uh, uh, they were on vacation, but they cut their vacation short. But their mission was, she told them, Juno, that was what she called me, he will not go in the Marine Corps. You understand? Your job is, is uh, Papa and I will go for a ride, you will talk to him, and he will not go in the Marine Corps. You understand? Of course, Angela and Frank, mm, you know. Yes, Mama. Well, that, that meeting, <laughs> if you three were my brothers, uh, I would sit down and they said, sit down. The meeting lasted about 30 seconds because Angela leaned over and says, Jay, if you don't go in the Marine Corps, we're going to break your friggin' legs. <laughs> of course, Teresa comes in with my dad. You know, well, my dad was a wonderful man, but she had that little ring in his nose, you know. You know. They came in and she saw right away. She says, to the three disciples. <laughs> she says, I'm a mad at you. <laughs> she used a word, uh, you know, you said it tinkled me off. She used a different word. She says, you're really pissed me off. <laughs> you're making me disappointed. And you, stupid though. <laughs> I'm standing over there where she said. She says, you come home. Terrific story on, on how you got there. What and what she said, you know, come home. Wherever you go, you, you come, come home. home. Yep, no matter what, you come home. The, um, and now I forgot what I was, oh, but you keep talking about her being Italian, but your mama spoke how many languages? Five, fluently. Fluently. To include Navajo in those days, it, it, through her business was, you know, Navajo was an unwritten language. And I'll tell that quick story is that uh, in, in, you know, I was a little puppy. And in those days, the American Indians could not drink. They couldn't buy booze. They're prohibition times. So they would come in from the reservations into Winslow and Flagstaff, and we had a couple of stores, in, uh, a store in each town. And the bootleggers would get hold of them, of course. And they would come in, the bucks would come in with their government checks, and uh, the bootleggers would sell them whiskey and wine and whatever, and take all their money. And once the money was gone, they would tell the bucks, if you want more whiskey, go take the jewelry off your ladies and bring it to us and we'll give you more whiskey. Well, my mom got wind of that. And uh, in her way, she told them that, uh, you know, well, I gotta back up. Arthur Ruby was one of the bootleggers and he just so happened in front of her, one of her stores, uh, she saw him negotiating and this guy was handing over, you know those big blossom turquoise silver stuff in the old days? I mean, it cost about $80,000 today. And uh, he was about ready to accept it. She got a broom. <laughs> a picture of this guy talking to this guy. She comes out of her store and whaps this guy in the back of the head, whap! And knocked him to his knees, you know. And uh, she says, no more of that. So what she did, she told the ladies, when you come from the reservation, bring me all your jewelry. And we had a huge safe, you know, and she put their names on it on Friday night, Monday morning, they'd come in, and she never cheated them. But guess where they bought their boots, their saddles, Levi's, and shirts? It was at Teresa's. But uh, she would not take, uh, she hated to, uh, the, the way that the, the American Indians were treated. She says, someday it's gonna turn around. Damn if it, it, if it hasn't. Look at all the casinos. They're not in covered wagons anymore. They're driving Cadillacs and big trucks, pulling horses and so forth. You know, getting about six to $10,000 a month tax-free from their casinos. 
you know, and I said, hey, I grew up with you guys. How about cut me in, you know? <laughs> and I love the American Indians. You know, I, uh, the Cherokees, the Navajos, the Hopis, the Zunis, and the Apaches, uh, they're just all wonderful people. And the Hopis, uh, if you just, if you've never been around and really sat in front of the elders uh, and just let them talk, it was, it was amazing for me to, uh, to sit at the foot of the elders and listen to what they, what they talked. They were talking about, the Hopis were already in my time, and I'm talking six, seven, eight years old, they were already talking about Asia, something about in the future with the t people with wear turbans is gonna cause problems. That was 100 years ago, how old am I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I haven't figured it out You know, it, it was <laughs> amazing how uh, uh, the Hopis are unbelievable, but the Navajos and the Apaches are good also, very good. Do um, we have some more questions from the audience, perhaps? I got a couple. Oh, wherever, wherever. <laughs> yes, sir, you were first. Oh, those are two really different questions. How did the family end up in Winslow, which is one okay. question, and then the other one was how is the Jay Vargas of today okay. different from Jay Vargas of a young man? Well, history, as you know, when immigrants came into our country from the European front, uh, they all went into New York City, first of all, to that island, and uh, then they all went different directions once they got their papers, and uh, my mother's clan went into Chicago with the rest of the Mafia gang. <laughs> and then my dad went west uh, to join up with his, his father. Uh, it was already established. And they knew each other in New York uh, briefly and chatted and probably had uh, supper with the rest of them. And then somehow a little community called Gallup, New Mexico um, along the Santa Fe Railroad. My mother, when she left Chicago to go west, she became what they call a Fred Harvey girl. And a Fred Harvey girl is, uh, there were La Posadas, as you know, all the way from Chicago to Los Angeles to the west. And she worked in the one in, in Gallup. Uh, she had the white collar with a brown dress and so forth. So she was one of the waitresses. And when the trains came in in those days, they would stop and passengers would get off and go into the restaurants and eat and get back on a train. And then somehow he ended up in Gallup, and that's how the family started. They met there, and uh, then they decided to, to go into uh, to Winslow and Flagstaff because a lot of the Italians were, you know, were, were settling in there, dairies and so forth. Uh, and she, I don't know how she came up with the idea, I'm gonna open up a country western store, and uh, it paid off. Um, but she was more than, than just a lady in business. Uh, any immigrant that came into to those two cities, uh, she spotted them. And uh, I never did ask where she got the money, but sometimes she would, uh, you know, someone would come in and, you know, Teresa, can I borrow some money? I want to open up a, a grocery store. And, and uh, these would be either Chinese, Japanese, or uh, she's, what do you need? And she'd give them $500. $500 in those days were a, that was a lot of money. And, uh, but they all paid her back. There was never a piece of paper signed by my mother and whomever she gave the, the money to. Uh, we had a black gentleman who wanted to open a barbershop for blacks uh, in my hometown. You know, they weren't allowed to go into the barbershops. And so she spotted him. That was Mr. Simpson. And, uh, and the woos, and, the, and uh, uh, they opened up the, the meat markets and so forth. And, and uh, I don't know where all that money came from, but I have since learned a little bit, but I can't share it. <laughs> <laughs> You see, my mom's uh, Sandini was one of the big mafia families, and, and uh, but there was a war down in, in uh, Sicily, so 
her clan went up to Caltrano in northern Italy. Uh, and uh, because something was, you know, there was a new turnover of, of uh, the mafia kings. And, and uh, so I always wondered, how the hell did she get all that money? But uh, uh, she came over with Joe Bonanno. Do you know who in the hell he was? <laughs> Mom was, uh, Mr. Bonanno was uh, the only surviving Don of the entire mafia from New York, okay, in the old days. His trade of fame, of course, is when Jay died, they put him in a casket here, but when Mr. Bonanno wanted to get rid of somebody else, he would put somebody under Jay. So this casket would go in and you'd never find out what happened to Frank or Joe, whatever his name is. And I'm not saying my mother was mafia. <laughs> <laughs> but the tree line was there. And anyway, she, took, she gave everything to the people. A lot of money went out to the, to the people. And you know what's amazing? Without a piece of paper being signed, they, she, they, she always got her money back. That's just the way people were in those days, you know. They worked their butt. And there were times when some of the ranchers couldn't handle their, uh, their stocks, and, and uh, I'd end up with two goats in my backyard. Now, what the hell am I going to do with two goats? But I had lambs, I had chickens, I had uh, ducks, I had turkeys. Uh, you know, right in this, of course, we're at the edge of town, and we, we had corrals and so forth. And, uh, so I was one of those little guys who was always dodging tennis balls, but I was always riding the goats or butting heads, you know, and I had these animals all around all the time. And, and I'm getting, oh God, I can't tell them the whole story, but. Uh, <laughs> I was say, let's take a few more questions sure. and see questions. if we can, you yes, know, this sir. gentleman's had his hand up quite a while. I'm leaving uh, next week to go to my fifth year reunion at the Naval Academy back in oh. Ah, congratulations. Uh, In the battlefield, Dido, the Battle of Dido. Uh, you know, at the time, uh, it was ugly, number one. I don't have to tell any of you that. Uh, war is vicious. Uh, after it was over, I think I just wanted to, to uh, continue on with my career. Uh, Post-traumatic stress kind of leaked into my BB brain, uh, like it has to many of the warriors. And, and uh, I didn't really sense it, so I had I had to get cured. Uh, and uh, my hometown, you know, we had one doctor, and half the time he was drunk, you know. <laughs> but I loved him, Doctor Wright. But uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> my brother spotted me. We, you know, it was almost. There was a movie called The Deer Hunter many years ago, and it was very similar stories. We used to come together once a year to go deer or elk hunting, uh, and uh, everyone got their deer but me, and it was my day. We weren't, we weren't going to go home until, we were not going to go home until uh, I got my buck. And, uh, and that's when my oldest brother, <clears throat> Angelo, sensed that there was, I couldn't, I couldn't pull the trigger. So he says, okay, uh, we're gonna go see Mr. Johnson. Now I'm gonna take it to Iwo Jima. Mr. Johnson was a code talker, a Navajo, who my brother was assigned to uh, on that island. Uh, but Angelo, we all grew up with, a, with the American Indians in Northern Arizona. So he says, well, we're gonna go out to the reservation. I'm gonna turn you over to Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson was an elder at the time. He was also a shaman. And uh, that was my cure. I spent four days, and five days in the sweat lodges. You know, I uh, can't go into the details, nor can I uh, talk about their methods of cure. Uh, but it really helped me. And I had other Navajo boys in, uh, Four of us uh, in in the sweat lodges, and, and it works. 
I didn't have a psychiatrist in Winslow. Hell, I couldn't even, you know, they can't even spell it in that town. <laughs> but uh, I decided at the time that uh, I was gonna continue on in the Marine Corps. And uh, I went as, uh, I wanted to lead troops, both in peacetime and combat. That was one of my goals that I set for myself as a Marine. Uh, I always wanted to set the standards very high. And uh, I always wanted to, to uh, lead and, and take care of them. And uh, I really wanted to be the best damn Marine in, in, on the planet. Now, was I? Who knows, you know, you, you have people write stuff on you just like you get teachers, uh, what do you call them, uh, evaluations, uh, ours for fitness reports. Uh, I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this uh, Marine Corps, and I loved it. I was fortunate to have, which is unusual, and probably Frank knows this, I was allowed to have 10 commands in my 30 years in the Corps, unusual. And some of them I got because some, some guys refused to take command. I mean, a lot of people are afraid to take in charge of either anywhere from 50 to 5,000 Marines. And in my last command, I had 5,000 Marines to take care of, but, and their families. But uh, I enjoyed, and, and I retired. Uh, I wanted to make Colonel, Bird Colonel. That was my, my, as far as I wanted to go. And I could have gone further, I'm told. I was told, and they were mad that I left, but uh, that's the way it goes. But the thing about when, when you're in your career right now, you know, you have to love what you're doing. Um, if you're not really into it 100%, then it's time to try something else. But I, I tell you right now, and I'm serious as to what I said in my first remarks, you are the most precious people the country. What you do with that individual student or students is so important. And I challenge you, if you have the worst damn student uh, that drives you crazy, that you almost want to pick up and throw against the wall sometimes, that's the one that you've got to pour yourself into and make sure that you saved him somehow. Uh, but no, and then I left the Corps, and, and Pete Wilson was governor of uh, the state of California, and he asked me uh, to be his secretary for Veterans Affairs, so I did that for his term. And then I said, I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> and then uh, a guy by the name of, he was the governor of Texas, coming through San Diego at a function. He was running, I guess he was campaigning, and uh, it was President Bush. And it was a function, you know, a cocktail function in San Diego, and I was asked to show up, and he kind of came up and said, Jay, what the hell are you doing nowadays? And I said, trying to learn how to hit this little friggin' white ball down this big, you know, <laughs> and I'm not doing worth a damn, you know. And he says, I want you to go to work for me. And I said, I'm not gonna go to Austin, Texas. Are you crazy? And uh, but I didn't say it that way. I said, sir, I'm very happy in San Diego, and I'm not a, you know. <coughs> And bad memories in Texas. <laughs> so, so he says, no, no. And just to show you how cocky he is, and still is, and was, he goes, Jay, I'm gonna be the next president of the United States. You know, typical Marine BB brain. I said, yeah, right. Yeah, okay, yes, sir. He says, okay, when I get to your, I'm calling you, I said, okay, sir. And I did work for his papa a little bit in the White House, just as a flunky. And, uh, it, uh, it happened. It was a week and a half after he was sworn in, the phone rang at the house. He says, okay. Uh, just like Pete Wilson did, he says, I want you to come and work for me. And I said, oh, Jesus, I'm a West Coast boy. <laughs> I said, sir, I, I'm not coming to Washington, D.C. And he says, no, I'll get you an office in San Diego. He did. And he says, I'm going to let you be the veterans liaison to the secretary and to me, but I'm going to let you take care of everything west of the Mississippi, 19 states, I guess that's how many, Guam, Samoa, Philippines, and Japan, because a lot of veterans retired in the Pacific. And my job is to go through hospitals and so forth and identify some of the problems. 
and I'm not bragging about this, but um, upon my turnover to uh, uh, the new regime that came in, uh, I had five, five key things that I felt wrong with the, with the VA. And it's amazing, after 13 years, they're still finding those same five problems that we identified 14 years ago. You know, the backlog, care of the, of, of the veterans and so forth. So I said, okay. That for his term, I said, I don't want to work anymore. And uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Commandant of the Marine Corps called one night and said, suicide prevention, we need you. We want you to wherever you want to go and talk to the troops and motivate them. All services, and I've been to the, all of them. And my mission is to let them know that life is too precious to throw away. You know, we're losing t uh, 20 a day now. 20 a day of all across the board committing suicide. Uh, but it's just not the military. High schools are starting to go through it right now. It's heartbreaking. But uh, I just told a story to, to the folks earlier that while I was out in Hawaii, uh, one of the top leading candidates uh, at NCO school, lady, was going to graduate number one with the highest marks that anybody's ever made there. She was gorgeous. Et cetera, et cetera. They, upon graduation, there was already rumors they were going to promote her meritoriously to staff sergeant. And two days before graduation, she hung herself for absolutely no reason. You know, no one could find a note. So that's what I'm doing now, is on top of helping Kathy with CDP and going to the schools. And uh, I travel the country talking to, to uh, and I have a lot of wives uh, get hold of me through the Medal of Honor Society. Uh, Jay, can you come and help you us? You want to phrase that differently. No, wait, okay. <laughs> I have a lot of wives, okay. <laughs> Damn, I'm good. <laughs> I'm bragging now, you know, that this old, this old goat can't entertain anything anymore. But, uh, but still, it, uh, I'm doing now. And, and, and say one which I know I have saved 10,000, uh, that's, that's what I want to do. It's, it's just, uh, it's a shame. It's, it's an epidemic. Nobody can put their finger on it. I've had, spoke to 2,000 psychiatrists, counselors, doctors in this big theater in San Diego, the town and country and uh, area, and they were, they asked, uh, hey, Jay, can you tell us what's going on out there? And I said, Jesus Christ, help, help me. You're the ones that are supposed to be telling me what's going on. Uh, it's tough right now. I, I can't put my finger on it. But what I can do for you is to just simply ask you to be in, not, an ambassador. When you see a troubled kid, you know, even if it's time to go home, take 10 more minutes to sit down with him and just simply say, hey, what, what's the problem? And uh, uh, you got a lot of kids. You know, I was shocked at the number. Somebody gave me some figures out of Washington of how many students are just walking away from the education. They're quitting high school. Thousands upon thousands. And the, tell me why. None of you can tell me. It's, it's a mystery in itself. And uh, I just think we have to do a little bit as teachers than just the daily routines. I think you have to spend a little more time at the end of the day just kind of giving that little motivational pitch that you can give uh, about the precious, precious part of life and uh, education and so forth. Thank you for all that you do and have done. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's been fun. It's, it's been fun. I've been a very lucky guy. Yeah. Yes. Question over here. Yes, ma'am. I'm a military family, CB husband, foreman son, but I have one son that wants to be a Marine. What is your advice to boys going into the Marines now? What would you give he does, advice for preparing for it? If his heart's in it, oh, yeah. 
let him go or I'll break his legs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were, I met you earlier, and you were telling about your CB husband, wonderful outfit, and, and uh, you're a military family, yeah. and let him go. Oh, we will. I have yeah, a, let him go. He has a grandma that's kind of telling not to. Uh, you know, they're all, <laughs> grandmothers don't know everything. They think they do, but. Uh, Watch it. What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> leave grandma alone. Okay, leave grandma alone. <laughs> we, we have other uh, additional questions? Yes, sir. I guess I have a comment and a question. Okay. Jim Levinson, yeah. 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 Jim Levinson at an Echo Company. I had golf in over three days. We both <laughs> had earned the, the medal. Uh, the Battle of Daido was a fight to death. We knew it. Uh, we were up against 15,000 North Vietnamese, and we were only at 700 of us. Uh, but we did well. Of course, we had supporting arms aircraft, artillery, naval gunfire, you know, all that stuff that they didn't have. And uh, at the end of a three-day ugly, ugly battle, we lost 78 in our battalion, and we, we killed 2,000. And then I was told, some of us have gone back to Vietnam. I haven't yet. Uh, I'm not ready to go back yet. I know the Bible says to forgive, but I'm just not there yet but a lot of my peers had gone back and they, they met some of the commanders that we fought against in the Battle of Daido. He says, yes, you did kill uh, your, your battalion. You did uh, take the lives of the enemy force up to 2,000. He says, but it was much higher than that because we had to go back across, as wounded as we were, we had to go back across to North Vietnam and we lost thousands on the way back to Hanoi. Uh, in route because they didn't have any medical uh, hospitals to go to. Uh, yeah, Jim Livingston is on the East Coast uh, and we communicate just about at least every two weeks we talk and wonderful man. Uh, but we both agreed that it wasn't us, it was my Marines, that's how I look at it, that did some things that was unbelievable in combat. 18, 19 year old young men. Just, I can't even, I can't even write a story about what I saw. It just, I, I can, but I can't describe it in words. It just, what they did, those young, you know, and here's, here's seniors that you probably had in high school. <laughs> you know, and a lot of them were shy and boy, not in combat. Those guys were unbelievable. Now we worked, second battalion, fourth marines, so don't, don't get this all wrong. Uh, our logo is the Magnificent Bastards. But a lot of us had fathers. <laughs> so, um, Jim Livingston actually wrote a book, the name of which escapes me at the moment. Noble Warrior. Thank you, Noble Warrior. And it covers in great detail uh, both his company's involvement and the, the Dido battle that Jay's company was in. So you might want to take a look at that. It's a tough read. Really tough. Where are you teaching at San Diego? Uh, it's my friend, but the way oh, I, I see. Is I'm in World War II Airborne Demonstration Team, so we do military-style guns. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, and so I get a chance to interact with people who are incredibly grateful for the kind of service that you do. Um, and my question to you would be: Right now, I have such a hard time speaking to the political climate because I'm an educator. You know, I'm not a person to take a side. I always wonder what's the most effective way of helping our students remember, honor, and serve the memories of those who came before us and, and have given us the freedom to be able to make a decision on what that flag means to us. You know, I, everyone says it's so difficult. I don't think so. Uh, you have to communicate. Uh, and, and you just have to let them I like to take people back as to, I don't know which table's got sacrifices, but uh, wow, 
let me tell you, uh, when you take them back and talk about sacrifices and patriotism and dedication and citizenship and so forth, and that's how we came up with this six things in which the lovely teachers took and developed this tremendous program. Uh, when you take them back, especially on sacrifices, uh, as to what has been done for that individual where he's at today, uh, a lot of them don't really realize, my God, you know, I can't believe it. Those people uh, sacrificed their lives for me to live in this freedom. Today's society is so spoiled. My mother said, you know, she was went through the wars in Italy in, in, in World War II, and, and she told me that America will never, never understand or come, come together ever again uh, until something happens here, uh, like oh, an invasion of some sort. I thought when the towers went down that this country was going to really come together. We did for a, for a while, uh, and we still do it every, every year. But it's not like that spirit that we had in World War II, you know, that, that this nation came together and stuck together. Now there's just so many laziness, and I call it, and, and uh, patriotism is probably forgotten by a lot of people. Uh, sacrifices, don't, they don't understand it anymore. Uh, but that's where you can, you can communicate with your students and let them know just how lucky they are. You know, and I tell the students, I said, you know, not one of you should ever leave this classroom without thanking your teacher at the end of the day or at the end of the week and say, great presentation, sir. Uh, thank you for what you're doing for me. I said, how many of you ever done that? Not one hand went up. And I said, okay, well, let me challenge you. Try it next week. But don't be afraid to go up and say, hey, Mr. Dork, horrible class. You know, you didn't do well on this one. But um, uh, we'll talk about it Monday. And then walk away, you know. I wonder how many teachers' teeth would fall out of their jaws if some kid came up and said, I said, talk to your teachers. Talk to your dad, too, and your parents. And I emphasize God. I, I tell them, hey, you believe in some high spiritual thing. I don't care whether it's Jesus or whatever, whatever faith it is, but you have to believe in a supreme being. They kind of look at me like, Jesus, nobody's ever asked me to, to believe in a supreme being. And I said, well, tell me what yours is. I don't have one. And I said, uh, you and I need to talk. <laughs> yeah. And that's all it took. And uh, so it, there's so much, they're hungry. The students are hungry. They just need to be, they need to be taught. And I think that's why the teachers are all telling me nationwide, wherever we go, they just want to teach. You know, I, I learned so much from my teachers. I really did. Uh, it, you know, I, getting back to that math story I told you about, I wasn't cut out. You know, algebra, okay, I could do that. But when it got on to trig and geometry and all that stuff, I said, <laughs> you know, take me back to the three R's. And I, and I went and I said, teach me how to write a friggin' check. Teach me how to buy a car. Teach me how to buy a house. Teach me how to buy clothes. Uh, what's the taxes all about, and so forth. You don't talk about that in school anymore. Uh, and the reason I brought up that check business, I'm standing in line behind this sailor. No, wait, I'm sorry, let me back. I'm at the counter writing a check, and I could almost feel the breath of this young sailor kind of looking over my shoulder. He'd been out at sea for six or seven months, uh, and you know, I finished my check and I said, what's the problem? He says, sir, I got $10,000 in the bank. They've given me this book and I don't know how to write a check. And I said to myself, I said, you gotta be kidding me. But no, he did not. Now this wasn't Gomer Pyle. This was just an average sailor, a good sailor. So I said, okay, get over on the counter. And I 
got his checkbook and I said, how much do you want? He says, well, I got four days of liberty in San Diego, uh, $200, that's all I need. <laughs> and I said, not in San Diego. <laughs> Let's go for 500, 600, and then you can, well, after I teach you, you can come back. So I taught him how to write a check, and I opened up his, his and I selected that check from him, and I showed him all that. And he looked at me and he says, God, nobody's ever taught me how to handle my money. So you see what we're missing here in our educational system? And these are very strong topics. We love these topics. But the simple things that students ought to be learning, like I, I had teachers talking about real estate buying when I, was, when I was in high school, you know, in the business classes. And I learned how to buy a car. And I learned how to watch out for the shyster, you know, and, and so forth. And uh, we don't do that nowadays. We don't spend time in just teaching the simple facts of life. Um, Jason's given us the hook here. I don't um, care what Jason <laughs> says. <laughs> yeah, well, and, <laughs> and I actually want to, I want to throw something out here. Oh, wait, no, wait, not at you. What, what you said was absolutely spot on, on on so many things. But to go back to your, your question, uh, before I took this job, I spent 33 years in a classroom and at the college and university level. So to, and this program prides itself on not being political and that it's a very difficult time to deal with what you're talking about when two of the things that are on our tables here are citizenship and patriotism. So from a teaching perspective, try taking it back to the, the basics of the language arts teacher, sorry, <coughs> symbolism. You know, what, what is the flag? What does it represent? And then talk about the current events. What were, ask your kids flat out, say, okay, what were they protesting this weekend? This last weekend, what were they protesting? Anybody? You know, I don't even know. Were they protesting the flag? No. Were they pro protesting the United States? What were they protesting? Social injustice. Social injustice. How many of them were protesting the government, the, the president shooting off his mouth last weekend? Oh, they were. Now, does the president, does the flag represent the president shooting off his mouth? Nope. So if you want to take it back to a discussion, you can say, when you make a decision about whether or not you are going to stand up in honor of the flag mm. or for the national anthem, you need to think about not what you just heard from the, the news or what you saw on a tweet, but ask yourself, what is it that you're disrespecting? You know, the family dinner that you were talking about, mm -hmm. with your mom expected everybody to be home. Automatic. If death. you didn't go home, how would she have perceived that? Well. Was it about the spaghetti and meatballs? No, she would be offended. Yeah, it would be about yeah. her. And then so, I'd be one big fat butterball. Butter ball. <laughs> You know, if nobody showed up to eat, I'd have to eat. Hey, let, let me back up a second. And no, I was joking, by the way. <laughs> Look how tall he is. <laughs> Jason and Courtney are two of my favorite people. And, and Jason is one of the, I'll tell you, his high school. I've gone to his, his uh, school and uh, his classes, and his students adore him. And, uh, and you've been to Courtney's and, too. And Courtney, I've been to Courtney's school. Courtney, you got a great school. But the thing I want to let, let you know about Kathy and, and the dedication of our teachers, and it's, it's from your community, your teachers, that have come on board with this program and have really taken it at all over the nation. And you know what I like about having the teachers uh, do the presentations to you is because teachers like teachers to talk to them because you can relate so much to each other. And, uh, you know, for me to come up here and, you know, Colonel Marines, you're going to learn how to speak about the three R's. You know, it, it's not going to fly. You get your legs broken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's not going to fly. So we knew right away that teachers working with you, uh, you would respect that more. And, and these two here, and, and, and of course, Kathy's the, the top leader of this program. It's getting huge. It's getting huge. And it's catching on like fire. And, We're uh, cutting into their lunchtime, so we need to go. OK. <laughs> I, uh, I, I just simply want to say thank you for what you're doing. I am so honored to be before you. Uh, I love your profession. 
It's the greatest thing going in America, and you're the ones that are going to be the ones that are going to make the future citizenship of, of this nation. And I, I wish you all the best. I really do. Thank you Thank for you. being here.